now going to hand over to Jeff Watts. Jeff is a Scrum and Leadership Coach, and his talk is on why great teams are more important than ever. Jeff, over to you. Cool. Thanks, Alex. So let's share this one and get it up there. Is that working okay? Can I get a thumbs up from someone? That's looking okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Thank you. So, yes, why are great teams needed more than ever? Um, so I've been, I've been doing a few talks recently because um, a few people have been asking me to talk about uh, my new book, which is great. And first thing I say to everybody is I feel really guilty talking about a new book that's coming out with, with everything that's going on in the world. Um, but there is, there's, for me at least, there's this view for the, that um, right now it's, it's great teams that are going to help companies, first of all, survive uh, this period because a lot of companies may well not, uh, but also thrive. Uh, and I think it's those great, great teams that are going to help make those organisations make the difference. Now, I think we can probably all agree, although I, do, I don't really like it when people start by trying to guess what I'm thinking. Um, but I think we can probably all agree that we're living in interesting times. I think the word interesting is something we can probably all agree on. Um, for me, one of the things that I found particularly interesting, having worked with organisations that have been toying with, to various degrees, this idea of, shall we become more of an agile organisation? Shall we not? Do we really mean it? Do we not? They've kind of been faced with a really stark choice over the last couple of months. And that choice has been about how much do they truly trust and enable their people. And seeing how different companies have reacted to that choice, they might not have realized it was a choice, quite often it's, it's subconscious, but seeing how organizations have reacted has been quite fascinating for me. I think on the whole, generally, most organizations um, and most national institutions by and large have, have acted pretty well in the early stages of the crisis. So when, when there is a crisis, uh, I'm not just talking about a pandemic here, but a business crisis, the first thing leaders really need to do is they need to make some quick decisions, undemocratic decisions, um, and that's the right thing to do. Uh, we don't necessarily want a lot of conversation and a lot of people's uh, input into something when a, when a really quick decision is needed. And those quick decisions are there to try and stabilize, first of all, the business and the people um, but also then the immediate future. It's the right thing to do, um, and it's also what people are looking for. And that's important as well, because if leadership acts as the people they're leading expect them and want them to act, then that organisation and their leadership will avoid what, what I tend to call motivational debt. If I'm acting as a leader in a very directive decisive, undemocratic way, but the people that I'm acting towards are expecting a democratic approach or autonomy, then they're going to be incredibly frustrated and dissatisfied by that. But equally, if that, those people, that team, are expecting me to be decisive and, and not democratic, but I come in and ask them, you know, what, what do you think we should do? Then that's going to cause motivational debt as well, just a different kind of motivational debt. So that's a good thing, okay? So leaders on the whole have acted pretty well in the start of this. Get things safe, simple messages, clear messages, make some decisions. Unfortunately, for some people, the crisis has been an excuse. An excuse to indulge their somewhat controlling nature, shall we say, more than perhaps they should have done. And I th and maybe like me, you've heard some of the stories of employers installing tracking and monitoring software and policies on their people who've been you know, forced to work from home. And it's, it's very easy to, to stay in that mode of, OK, well, yeah, we need to make decisions. It's still a crisis. It's still a crisis. Um, but actually, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence around that we've been aware of for a long time that actually micromanaging past the point of crisis is going to be counterproductive. For other companies, the few that stand out, this has actually been a fantastic opportunity. Now that might sound very callous for me to say. Um, I'm not trying to downplay the, 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 the bad situation at all, but for some organizations, they've really thrived here. And I'm not talking about the obvious examples of people, you know, Zoom who've had a massive growth in 
um, uses and licenses and things like this. And as we were talking about beforehand, the, the companies that are selling all the, the home working equipment like microphones and lights and cameras. I'm talking about those organizations whose leadership have for, for months and years invested in the, the development of the relationship between them and the people that they work with. They've, they've built up trust, they've built up goodwill through, uh, among other things, enabling autonomous self-organizing teams to solve business valuable problems. And, and those organizations, when faced with this situation, have those teams have actually taken to it like the proverbial duck to water because this is something that they've been used to. You know, actually being left to their own devices and given some steer and checking in now and again, this is what they've been used to. Um, so they, that's where those two types of organizations for me and those two types of leadership have really gone in very starkly different paths. I was going to talk you through a, a very simple exercise I was introduced to, but I didn't know whether I had time. I, I, I'll, try, I'll try and squeeze it in. I, uh, years and years ago, when I was first introduced to the concept of self-organizing teams, uh, so I was a classically trained project manager in a very bureaucratic hierarchical organization. So I believed as a manager, my job was to tell people what to do. Um, and some people were trying to, trying to change my mind about that, trying to change my perspective and, and, and make a servant leader out of me. Uh, and I was introduced in this exercise uh, called 50 Steps. And in it, you had to pair up. And one person was the boss and one person was the worker. The job of the worker was to produce 50 steps, basically walk 50 paces in the room. The job of the boss was to instruct the worker without touching them, using some simple commands, such as forwards, backwards, left, right, faster, slower, that kind of thing. The worker had to obey the boss. And there were some fairly static obstacles in the room, tables and chairs, but there were also some relatively complex variables in the room, other people trying to complete this task at the same time. If you bumped into them, or if you bumped into the wall, you bumped into obstacles, you know, there was a penalty. And within the time box, very, very few pairs actually managed to achieve it. And the second part of the exercise was there were no bosses. Uh, everybody had to achieve 50 steps using their own autonomy deal, dealing with the same situation. So as well as achieving the 50 steps within the time box, both employee and boss achieved it, so you more than doubled the productivity. And it was a very simple, oversimplistic um, example of the difference between command and control, but it kind of stuck with me. And this idea of complex environments, having a directive leader and micromanagement reduces productivity and increases motivational depth. The person in the, in the employee, the worker role, was really not happy about being told to walk forward when they knew they were going to hit a table. Um, and in this situation here where we have greater complexity, and we do have greater complexity, I mean, even if you take aside the pandemic, working in software development, working in product development, that is a complex endeavor. It involves other human beings and other human beings are complex, weird things. So it's complex anyway. And when you add on to the fact that we're all working in a new way, that's in suboptimal conditions, you know, I've got kids that I, I aren't going to school uh, so, and I've got bandwidth issues and all sorts of different things. I don't get the same communication channels that I had before. The complexity is increased. So we need, rather than to micromanage, and that's understandable because if I was a manager in an organization, my neck was on the line and I can't see what's going on. I'm going to be craving information and progress reports even if I know it's counterproductive. So what we really need is great teams. These great teams who have the ability to self-organize, not just themselves, but with their colleagues, to deal with the complexity as they see it. So that's, that's the kind of context for what I'm talking about and what I've written about. And I've been lucky enough to work with teams from lots of different domains, lots of different industries. Uh, so from Sujit's financial services to, um, uh, I think, Yana, you work in financial services at the moment as well, yeah? Um, to pharmaceuticals, to insurance, to completely outside of software and product development, research, marketing, sports teams, even, even I've, I've done a bit of work with medical teams. Um, and while every team is absolutely unique, they absolutely are, there are a few common patterns that I've noticed. And I'm not saying that you know, I've, I've found the secret or anything, but just some things that I've found quite useful to, to notice that these things have in common. Now, I'm not going to have enough time to go through everything in detail, but a little bit of an overview as to what I'm talking about when I talk about a great team. These sort of five characteristics that I notice, regardless of industry, regardless of domain, 
um, regardless of uh, the product that they're working on, the service that they're working on. It could be voluntary teams, school teams, sports teams, whatever. All these great teams that I've seen have a habit of self-improvement. They take getting better seriously. The other thing they take seriously is quality. You know, they, they attach their, their name, their personal reputation to what it is that they're doing, building, providing, serving, producing. Um, they have a strong sense of togetherness. Yeah, the team comes first and uh, that sort of, you know, we are in this together thing. They're brave. You know, they take audacious steps. And I saw in the comment earlier on, somebody, when, when Jana asked, what, you know, what's the one thing you'd like to see different in the world? And somebody commented about, you know, I'd like people to always be able to work outside of their comfort zone. Great teams regularly step outside of their comfort zone. I can talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But equally, as well as getting better and, and focusing on quality and feeling like a good team and being brave, all great teams deliver. Right? They all find a way to deliver stuff. I'm going to very briefly talk you through each of these five um, uh, and give you a little bit of an example. So self-improvement. Okay, all, all good teams improve. All great teams improve. Not because someone tells them to improve, not because they're paid or incentivized to improve, but because they want to, because it actually gives them a bit of a kick to get better. They like knowing that they're a little bit better today than they were yesterday. Another hallmark of, of Jana's talk there. And one of the big differences that I've seen between good teams and great teams, and actually before I go any further, good teams themselves are, are really good. You know, a lot of organizations that I've been in, a lot of teams that I've been in, wouldn't even classify themselves as good teams. You know, so good teams are already really, really a, a nice thing to be a part of, significantly better than just groups of people uh, lobbed together, resources, some organizations call them, and said, right, you're working together. Now that's not a team, okay? Good teams are already way above that, but great teams are that sort of 5% that really, you know, and, and you might only be a great team for a while, you might come back down from being that, but it's the little things that teams tend to set those apart. So most teams, uh, in fact, all teams, I would say, and this is no slight on them, this is not a, an insult to that team by saying this, but all teams have massive glaring opportunities to get better in the early days. Right. And, and you all know the journey that we go through. Again, Jana had the, the Tuckman curve on there. You know it's going to take time before we get to be a really good team. So during that growth period, there's always these massive opportunities and we can really get better at that. We can really get better at that. And actually a small amount of effort can yield quite big game changing, you know, headline grabbing changes in that, that team's effectiveness. And great teams do that as well, but they don't get complacent when they get to that sort of Pareto principle 80, 80 20 zone they keep pushing and even when it's small improvements you know they're 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 in a, they're in a habit um, and I in my book I cite Dave Brailsford who is a guy who um, was was a coach of the team GB cycling team and one of the things that he brought in was this concept of you know tiny gains you know improving everything and I mean everything from the comfort of the seats to the pillows that the, the, the cyclists would use when they go to bed at night to how they wash their hands everything his view was that if you could improve everything by one percent then the compound impact of all of those tiny gains would be massive and while each of those little changes was very very marginal yeah you know, these marginal gains added up to in their case record medal hauls and i've seen similar kinds of attitudes towards self-improvement in the great teams that I've worked with you know, and this sense of the milestones. Today we improve the little things. That milestone is often a lot more important than a big change that we make in a retrospective, for example. Get a little bit better every day, that's even more powerful. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about quickly was quality. Okay, so all good teams look at how they can avoid problems. I don't think you could really ethically call yourself or morally call yourself a good team if you weren't working out how you could mitigate the risk of things going wrong. Doing a bit of planning, doing a bit of risk mitigation. Now that's, that's quite normal for good teams, but great teams go even further. Now, great teams know that there are unknown unknowns, but they, just, they don't just take that as an opportunity to ignore it. They don't say, 
well, I can't plan for it because I don't know what's going to happen. So if you don't know what's going to happen, you can't do anything about it. Instead, what they tend to do is they look at developing their ability to respond calmly when any kind of unexpected event hits. Yes, they'll prepare for what they can prepare for, but they'll also be working on developing their resilience, their ability to cover each other, their ability to think rationally when chaos is going on around them. And my, my favorite story in the book is actually in this section because it shocks a few people when they read it, but I'm not gonna give you any spoilers. You know, I just have to read it for yourselves. Great teams are driven by well, I, I said this already, a pride in their work, right? They have this sort of personal sense of attachment to the reputation of what they are building. And, and they, you know, they're developing resilience, they're developing redundancy within their ranks so that they can kind of cope with almost anything that gets thrown at them. And this is a slightly dangerous thing for me to say, but it, again, I've seen it, so I'll report back. A lot of the great teams that I've seen actually see new problems as something cool in a way now what i mean by that is they see it as an opportunity to test themselves against something new it's it's like a, a new achievement that they can unlock because they know they're going to learn something they have confidence that somehow they'll find a way around it or in some cases the view that well if we can't find a way around it there's a good chance that nobody else would have been able to do any better so what's there to lose um, and i find that really really interesting seeing this this thing that comes up out of nowhere, this monster. Most people would be scared of it and run away from it. A great team thinks, cool, challenge. Uh, and that's, that's a, a big thing that sets them apart. The part of my book that in many ways was, I suppose, the easiest to write was about unity, because I think everyone really knows that good teams stick together, they're united, you know, they have a bond, they have a commitment to each other. But on the other hand, I think it was paradoxically also the most difficult to write because despite all that awareness, you know, the, the Tuckman model has been around for you know, 60 years. And yet there are so many teams out there that haven't gone through that storming phase well and ended up high performing. And I found that fascinating. Um, so a lot of teams have goals. All right. That's, that's a good thing. Goals are important because without a sense of purpose and objective that we're trying to solve or you know, yeah, that, that, that um, task that we want to complete, we haven't even got a chance of becoming a good team. Plenty of teams have goals. Uh, okay, you, you could say that um, they could do with some work, you could make them more personable, inspiring, engaging, meaningful, whatever, and that would increase their effect and I would probably have to agree with you on that one, but they have a goal. What surprises me is that so few teams have a strong identity that binds them, you know? And it surprises me because I haven't seen one great team that doesn't have a strong identity, that doesn't know what they stand for as a team, that doesn't know what they expect of each other, that hasn't taken into account their own personal likes, their personal values, their personalities, their skills of the individual team members and crafted them into something bigger and better. I haven't seen one great team without a strong identity. And I think it's important because not just from the team perspective, but from the individual perspective, if I'm going to be a member of a team and if I'm going to be a, you know, a useful member of a team, there's no getting past the fact that I'm going to have to give up or trade off a little part of me. I'm not talking about a physical limb or anything, but actually a little bit of my own personal selfish objectives, because there may well be times when I need to sacrifice what I'm personally interested in because the team needs something else from me. And that's often glossed over, sort of, well, let's just not talk about it because you know, that might put people off wanting to be part of the team. Now, hopefully the trade is mutually beneficial yeah, because that's how trades work. I have something, you have something, uh, we trade, we're both better off. And for me, that's where this identity comes in. That's what I'm getting in return for trading off a little bit of my personal selfish objectives. And it's a, it was just amazing for me that so many of the teams that I've worked with just haven't had that. Um, but there you go. That is such is life. Audacity. Um, personally, I, I, I like this. Uh, for those of you that have read, read any of my other books, you'll kind of notice a little bit of a theme going on, that this sense of bravery. It is, um, you know, it is you know, both 
uh, Suji and Yana talked a lot about taking a step forward, taking steps into the unknown. And that always requires a sense of bravery. It's not acting without fear. You don't have to be brave if you're not scared. You know, you kind of should be scared. Um, you have to be scared if you're going to be brave. Um, and what I found fascinating about the teams that were brave, you know, they all challenge processes. They all challenge policies, limits, systems, assumptions, all sorts of things. They take risks. They risk failure. They basically just go for it is that they didn't treat audacity as binary. And I think if I was to, you know, when I first came across that as a concept and I thought back to my view of audacity, I think I'd have to admit that I would classify bravery, audacity, as a binary concept. You either are brave or you're not. And I think that was a false assumption of mine. And this perhaps even a limiting belief. I think yeah, a lot of these great teams have looked at this thing and thought, well, okay, we're brave enough to try this. And one of the great things about doing that is that you're starting to expand your comfort zone and you're also building your bravery or audacity muscle, if you like. When, so the slogan here says a good team catches their teammates doing things wrong. A great team catches their teammates doing things right. I was, to use a really fantastic English phrase for you, flabbergasted. Um, when you know i thought co catching people doing things right would be so much easier and so much more commonplace than catching people doing things wrong so for me having to tell somebody that they're not doing something right sort of brings me up in a bit of a sweat i don't like the conflict how are they going to react giving people feedback you know, that kind of thing but actually saying oh nice job you did that really really well you know well done um well done for, for whatever it was that you were doing picking out the good behaviors in action should be a lot easier but I found the opposite. I found maybe it's maybe it's just the fact that I've lived in the UK for so long. We don't like telling people. Or maybe you know, someone can tell me that it's a, it's a cultural thing. But we do seem to find it easier to just sort of um, miss out on those specific appreciations. You know, a specific, not just saying well done, but well done for. You know, I appreciate you for this. You know, thank you for doing this. That. I think it's a really simple place to start for a lot of great teams. And that sense of, you know, if it is difficult, then that is brave for those individuals. That is, that is audacious for that team. Brilliant. Start there, build up to something else. And the final thing, I've left this till last because for many organizations, I think this is the big worry about agile teams. You know, uh, Sujit mentioned that in, in a, beta, uh, a B2B or B2C environment, there's always a, there's always a date, right? And there's stuff we need to do. And I think you know, speaking to a lot of leaders over the years, this idea of letting go of control and giving teams um, autonomy scares them. Um, and they worry about, well, what am I going to get in return? So and then, we, then we have people come along and saying, well, you need to make people happy. You know, this is all about mental health awareness and, and you know, all the good stuff that we talk about, psychologically safe environments and leaders thinking, yeah, yeah, but I still need my dates. I still need my deliveries. Come on. Um, I don't mind indulging this hippie stuff as long as I still get my stuff. And their, their concern is that they're not going to get twice the work in half the time. All right. Now, don't get me started on books that encourage that with their titles. Um, but teams will actually, in many ways, take a dip before they become hyper performing. And or at least appear to, because we're factoring in the whole life cycle now. And that, but team, great teams don't forget about delivery and not just because other people want them to, but it's just like with self-improvement, it's something that they want to do. These teams enjoy creating things that are used. They enjoy giving people something valuable. Now, good teams will use the agile approach and the built-in you know, cadences within something like Scrum, for example, the rhythm of the framework to become predictable in a good way. Right. So, and that's great because we can be relied upon to deliver stuff in a, you know, in a time box that's useful for planning, expectation management and so on. But great teams don't just find a rhythm. You know, they find flow, that magical, well, almost magical feeling of, you know, sort of forgetting that time is a concept, you know, stuff gets done really, really quickly, effectively, and it feels great when you're in flow. Now everyone's experienced that at some point, maybe not at work, maybe outside of work, but they've experienced it at some point. Right? Now, what I found interesting is great teams get into flow a lot more frequently than other teams, and it's not an accident. They do it consciously. 
Now, a lot of people, when they define flow, say it's very hard to know what it is until you've been in it. So if you don't know what it is, how can you actually create it? Well, the teams that I've seen, they look for patterns. So they look for contextual patterns. So they look for the environment, they look for times of day, they look for situations, problems, they look for anything that will indicate, yeah, this is something that was there when we had flow last time. And they'll keep logging these things and they will just tweak their environments, they'll tweak their, um, tweak their, their, their layout, their setup, their conversations, their working patterns, their environment in an effort to try and replicate that and maximize their chances of getting into flow. And when they do that, they do tend to over deliver. And it's not because they've rushed it. It's not because they've cut quality. It's not because they've worked overtime. It's not because they deliberately played those games of under committing and over deliver. They just get into flow and smash it. And I think that's fascinating. Um, but you, it, it's got to be that way round. If you're going into this with the objective of getting twice the work in half the time, you won't get that. I think that's my time box, possibly more. Apologies if I've blown it, Alex. Jeff, spot on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, really great talk from the three of you. And uh, I've, some great questions have been pulled in here. Um, so I'm going to go straight to... Um, what is your, uh, you came from a project management background. What is your opinion on the hybrid agile PM slash scrum master role that we so often see companies advertising for? Is this to me, Alex? That, sorry, Jeff, that one was to you, yes. Okay. Um, what's my opinion on it? Uh, I think it's, my problem with, with it really is, do the people that are asking for it know what they're getting? or know what they're asking for. So you could well have put me in that category. Um, but equally, you could put my boss in that category. And we're two very, very different people. Uh, I think we're both good people, but I think we're very, very different. And we could have the same job title, but approach the role and be a very different cultural fit for different organizations. Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the danger with any kind of role, I mean, even the role scrum master, uh, there are different sort of philosophical approaches on what, a, you know, what, what, what kind of scrum master that you want to be. Um, so I don't think you can really use any role to, to, to get the, or, or certainly assure yourself of getting the person or the impact that you're looking for. Um, and I know from my limited exposure to recruitment that that's not the point. Um, you know, it's always going to be part of the puzzle, right? There's always going to be a conversation. There's always going to be um, a sort of values alignment and a, you know, a cultural alignment and so on. Um, my, my, my worry is that um, if it's an early part of the process, then some people might feel they need to change who they're putting themselves out there as in order to get through the door. You know, one of the things I really liked about Jana's talk was being the best you you know and uh, what there's that's a, a better version of you and I, I, I think people shouldn't be afraid of it saying you know i am a scrum master now i can apply for an agile pm role will i still get a conversation with somebody about what i think i can do to help them meet their objectives while having a different role and i think that's my main worry with it okay thank you very much um, to Sujit, um, how do you drive innovation at Paysafe? Um, so to Jeff's point, right? I mean, I, I think innovation's almost got to be organic to a firm, right? Um, so one of the things that we've largely done within Paysafe is that unlike most organizations, what we don't have are guardrails, right? We, we haven't standardized the tooling within the organization, right? Um, we haven't um, kind of, so while we've kind of almost built out the standards to say, these are the standards that you need to comply to, um, as a firm, we are actually not prescriptive um, about solving for business problems, right? So very early in the cycle, uh, we have kind of institutionalized the 
element of uh, um, build versus buy, right? Where, I mean, we, we, we kind of, um, you know, so the mantra largely is that, you know, um, one way to kind of have a build and deliver products fast is actually to write the least amount of code. So early in the cycle, right, um, massive emphasis on build versus buy where we kind of almost incentivize the teams um, to pull together solutions as innovatively as possible. And within the development life cycle itself, um, we, we've kind of gone very heavily into the open source uh, ecosystem, right? So in essence, there are no guardrails. As long as we comply to the standards, what we've done is regimented our, um, our CI CD pipeline, we've regimented our um, um, how we log and monitor, right? But the entire thought process very much is around building that culture, right? So, I mean, so the classic example that we, we give is that going into production, things will always break, right? Um, you're never gonna be in a scenario where you're gonna write perfect code. But how that culture develops is that if I have an outage, right? And it takes me six hours to rec recover from that outage, you inherently build an organization that is risk averse and then they put in all the checks and regimented guardrails that are needed to prevent that as an outcome, right? But if we build out an ecosystem where if there is an outage, we are able to actually recover in under five minutes, um, a lot of that culture around wanting to build guardrails goes away, right? But the entire, so unlike most organizations, we don't actually have an innovation hub, right? Um, innovation is very much organic to the teams. And again, you know, no path is uh, perfect, right? So I, I think the ecosystem that we followed does come at a, at a cost. Um, but as long as the benefits outweigh the costs, um, it seems to work for us, right? Thank you, Sujit. To Yana, what inspires you? That is such a hard but simple question. Um, I think what inspires me the most is meeting that person that gives me a challenge because they challenge me to come up with new options and a different version of myself to learn. Okay, yeah, short and sweet, is. brilliant. <laughs> uh, to, so this one is actually to all three of you. Now what I've found has worked well in the past when the same question has gone to multiple speakers is that we sort of maybe put a time box on your answers. So if we can try and you know, keep your answers to 30 seconds each. Um, the question is, is what advice would you give to someone breaking into the world of Scrum or Agile on a larger scale? Jeff, I'll go to you first. If you could try and keep your answer to 30 seconds, as I say to it's all three of you. I hope this isn't going to use up my 30 seconds, but can you just repeat it again? It's something to do with larger scale. <laughs> of course. So it's what advice would you give to someone breaking into Scrum or Agile on a wider scale? Okay, okay. So breaking into it, I, I mean, first of all, as with anything, and again, I'm going I'm to steal from, from the other people's talks today, it's, is how does it match who you are? I think there's the great thing about an agile approach is there are, there are so many ways for you to, to fulfill your, or actually increase your fulfillment. Um, but it's got to be something that matches your personal value. So work out what's important to you and then find a role in an organization that allows you to live them. Thank you. And to Sujit? Yeah, very much along what Jeff said, right? And I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to um, adapting to that wider ecosystem, right? So, so I think Jeff spoke about the individual. From an enterprise perspective, I think you get a good starting point in terms of bedding it, but then how we evolve and scale it totally comes down to the organization culture and you know what works well. Um, so adapt to the organization's personality. Thank you, Sujit. And Yana? Uh, I would say check yourself before you wreck yourself. I stick to it. If you're about to think about scaling and growing, really draw boundaries for yourself. What do you know that you are comfortable at doing and that you feel confident at? What areas that do you feel more weak at? And I would say find someone that you can consult or that you can get some advice from to get feedback as you're testing and learning. Because um, if I reference back to Jeff, he actually put squads up. You're not the only person starting this journey. 
every speaker and a lot of people in this meetup, we've all gone on a similar journey. And although it's not going to be your journey and it's not going to be the same, scaling and that complexity, it's taking bits from other people's learnings and applying your own to really make it successful. That's my answer. Thanks, Jana. To Jeff, um, other than your own, can you recommend any books or other literature that can help me on my agile journey? It's a it's a difficult one because I, I would I would in, I'd want to know more um, because I think yeah if you're interested in being a product owner I could direct you to different books if you're interested in being you know, a, a business analyst maybe it's something else um, so I suppose it, it, with with the with the generic question like that um, Mike Cohn's books are great uh, if you wanted to learn about agile stuff if you wanted to go into sort of more of the, the philosophical underpinnings, one of my favorite books that, that I found really, really useful when I was, was starting out was The Goal by Goldrat. Um, just the, so the sort of principles of, uh, that, that really underpin what Agile is in many ways, even though it's a complete, you know, it's nothing to do with software development. And it's actually quite a daunting book when you look at it, it's quite thick, but it's a really easy read. Um, and I think it's a, a bit of an eye opener for, in many different ways. Thanks, Jeff. To Sujit, how has COVID-19 impacted PaySafe? Um, so surprisingly, not, a, not as extensively as we initially thought, right? So I, I think PaySafe in, in itself is probably not very different from a lot of firms out there, right? Um, we were able to make the transition to an all remote um, working ecosystem relatively fast, literally no bumps there, right? Um, probably goes down to the industry that we were in. Um, and from a pure business perspective, like in many organizations, I think we went into toxic shock in April. Um, May is kind of, we're kind of emerging from that element of shock to realize it probably wasn't as bad as we thought um, it would be. Um, hopefully the story just keeps getting better, right? So, so as disruptive as COVID was in terms of changing things, um, in my mind, irrevocably in, for the future, um, the both, you know, the environment as well as the uh, business as a whole continue to be pretty resilient. Thank you, Sujit. To Jeff, when you provide to a teacher, personality to play with receiver. and receiver. Is it just me that didn't get that? Looks like he's frozen up. No. No. Alex. Can you repeat that, please, Alex? Looks like he's frozen up. Can you try to reestablish? Oliver Bernard, you are out here. Uh... Sorry, Jeff. I've, I've got, I'm, I'm back in now. I think my okay. internet connection was a little unstable. So um, it just so look, wasn't I, me. That's good. Yeah, it was, I think it was me. Um, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, when providing feedback to a team and being audacious, how should personality types play a role in how we deliver and receive feedback? Um, I think you should always be aware of your audience. Uh, I think in general, yeah, there are a number of things that human beings have in common. Um, but for me, the first thing with regards to feedback is, well, there are two really important things with regards to feedback. It's more important, it's more useful if it's been asked for. Um, so just like you know, in my coaching work, I really try hard, sometimes I fail, but I really try hard to, to not go around inflicting my help on people. Um, equally, I don't want to go around inflicting feedback on people. If people want my feedback, I'll happily provide it. Um, and that goes two ways as well, because if people give me some advanced warning about the feedback that they're looking for, I can be more, more mindful about what I'm looking out for and more helpful in what I'm offering. Um, I think the, the second thing for me is, is around just knowing the sort of normal processing journey that we go through. Um, we used to teach people about the SARA model, where the first response is shock or surprise. Uh, often, if it hasn't been asked for, you know, wh wh why are you saying this? You know, and the next one is often anger. You know, how dare you? Who are you to, to tell me to give me that kind of feedback? Yeah, you know, before you can rationalise it, which is the R. Um, the other R is rejection. Um, and as as a person receiving feedback, and Yana talked a lot about feedback. I've got to be aware. I've got to be aware of it, being able to take that feedback as with the pinch of salt that it deserves. Right? It's their perception. It's not true. It's not fact. It's their truth, but it might not be 
truth to me and it might not be useful to me. Um, so I, I don't just take it just because it's been offered. I should consider it and then reject it if it's not useful to me. But if it is useful to me, then I'll accept it um, and I'll, I'll take it on board. Uh, so being aware where, where those people are on that curve, you, know, you hear, heard the whole phrase of sleep on it quite often. You, know, you need let, to let people sleep on things um, and just process it sometimes subconsciously on their journey home from work or something. Um, I, didn't, I didn't like the whole, we used to have these um, orange chairs in the office at BT. So there's no orange furniture in our house because they, they were the feedback chairs. You know, the boss would come along uh, from another office He'd come in and make his way over to the orange comfy chairs and one by one we'd be called over for our feedback session and you'd just be dreading it you know it'd be once once every six months or something um, and yeah that, that 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 sort of formality of it i don't really like thank you uh to yana uh, what advice would you give to somebody um when going through an agile transformation uh from a waterfall environment if it's just not being accepted? So, I think for me, this was probably the hardest thing is when you are that first agile person, understand what they know is their base and core knowledge. If it is waterfall, don't be afraid to pick up PRINCE2 or maybe P3O or MSP or some of those core knowledge that they have and try and take them on that journey of transitioning across into Agile because usually what I've found is it's either coming from fear, they feel like they're not going to have a role or they were the best PM or delivery lead or something and they feel that that purpose or how they identify themselves might not be the same if you go into an Agile but really it's not about Agile waterfall or how do you bring them, but it's about that outcome. What is that project? What is the purpose of that change in that project and wrapping it around? Don't say, I'm going to teach you this and it's better, but come in with, we're going to start problem solving differently. I'm going to be using techniques from Scrum or other Agile techniques, and we're just going to introduce them in as a step-by-step. -step. And what you want to do is build the trust of those around you first, rather than, I like to say, throw the guide at them. <laughs> That's kind of my answer. Find that commonality and start with that and build up and you will get that transition. And it will be hard because every action has an equal and opposite reaction and you've got to be prepared for that force. And you have to, what I like to say and what I train the product owners is, is learn how to counter the message before it comes back. So. Agile isn't working, product owner or team, we've solved this problem that we wouldn't have solved in the old way or in the way we were thinking. You've got to have your messages very clear and you've got to always counteract as a team or a unit. So you might join a team that might not be bought in at the start, but you've really got to build that trust because they are the advocates for the change. Thank you very much, Anna. And that's the end of the questions for this evening. I'd like to say a really special thanks to Sujit, Yana and Jeff for your fantastic, um, engaging and really insightful talks this evening. Thank you very much. Um, we actually hit record numbers for Remote Agile London tonight. So uh, thank you to everyone for getting involved and joining. You know, it's really appreciated. Um, just a closing statement so, uh, from myself, you know, I, I said this on our Product London meetup last night, we're certainly starting to see a bit of a positive change in the world of recruitment. Um, and I'm not saying that we've got vacancies coming out of our ears at the moment, but we are slowly starting to see things trickle through and are confident that will continue. So um, if you are looking for something new, um, you know, my name is Alex Scriven. I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn link in to me and I will um, reach out to anyone within my company that will be able to help you for the technology that you cover or area you work in. Um, so thank you very much. The slides will be up um, and the video will be shared through our communities page, which has a link to our U Oliver Bernard YouTube page. 
Again, thank you very much, Jeff, Lana, and Sajit for this evening. Um, really enjoyed those, those talks. And I, I will see everyone next week. Thank you very much. Thanks,